We were coming north of the um, Mekong River, flying to just south of the Plain de Jars. We were at 8,000 feet, when all of a sudden, bam, right between my feet, and I was sitting sideways in the seat, looking out a window to my left, and uh, this 23 millimeter anti-aircraft shell came up right between my feet, right between my knees, came up like this, and it exploded right here. Hi, my name is Richard Smith, and I have an interesting story to share with you. It was back in 1972, I was just 29 years old. I was overseas, I was in the country of Laos. I was flying on a caribou, uh, tail number 430. Uh, John Bannerman, Captain Bannerman was at the controls. We were doing an aerial resupply mission during the battle for Skyline Ridge. There were 27,000 North Vietnamese regulars um, trying to take uh, the area, the Skyline Ridge area, Long Chen Valley. And uh, so we were bringing in supplies. And uh, the, our supply that we were carrying, the code name for it over the radio, so that nobody knew what we were doing, was called hard rice, which was uh, for the code name for high explosive ammunitions of whatever kind that were being called for the airdrop. We picked it up in Udorn, Thailand, and uh, we were coming north of the um, Mekong River, flying to just south of the Plain de Jars. We were at 8,000 feet, when all of a sudden, bam, right between my feet, and I was sitting sideways in the seat, looking out a window to my left, and uh, this 23 millimeter anti-aircraft shell came up right between my feet, right between my knees, came up like this, and it exploded right here. And it was less than a foot away from the high explosives. And anyway, you can see that I wasn't hurt. It was as if there was a, a, an invisible shield between me and the explosion. The explosion took out, well immediately, red hydraulic fluid started spraying down from the overhead because the explosion went upward mostly. And uh, hydraulic fluid was spraying down and my first thought was, is the airplane's bleeding. <laughs> That's what your mind does in a quick sense like that. And uh, anyway, I got up and moved right away, and like that was a bad place to sit. <laughs> and anyway, we, st we broke off the approach to the drop zone, and we started heading back, and we had to assess, assess the damage. And we knew that we had lost the ability to use our flaps and uh, the landing gear and the brakes because they were all hydraulically uh, operated. Well, um, as we headed back, we were going to land at Vinchen. We thought, well, we're not sure that the landing gear would stay down on landing, and if, if, if the landing gear collapsed, because we're going to try to free fall it, if the landing gear collapsed, um, we could ignite you know, sparks and gas and whatever could ignite the explosives. And so we decided to jettison the cargo made a pass alongside the runway, we dropped the cargo, swung back around, dropped the landing gear, and hoped that it would stay down. We made it okay, but I can't explain. How come I didn't get hurt? I can't explain it. Now, I'm here, obviously, and it doesn't look like I'm hurt. I, actually, I never received a scratch. Now. Most everybody I share this story with will say, well, that's unbelievable. And in a sense, it is. Um, but there's more to the story. I want to, um, I want to share the story. This is the first, this is one incident of, of several that happened when I was overseas. Stories that were unbelievable, that uh, were just hard to explain. And I didn't know what was going on at the time. So what I want to do to, to 
help you get an idea of the story, a little better idea of the story, I want to back up a little bit to my early childhood, how I got into this position. Uh, before I was five years old, I had pneumonia five times, and I almost died. I was mostly in the hospital or sick in bed, and by the time I got to kindergarten, um, I didn't even know how to play with other kids. I never had a chance, and so I ended up flunking kindergarten, a silly thing, and so trying to catch up and, and, and all of that. So I was small for my age, um, and, uh, but I made it through high school. I graduated from high school, but what high school couldn't give me, <clears throat> I, I thought, you know, what can I do? You know, am I really a man? I graduated from high school. So I thought, okay, I know. And just on the spur of the moment, I decided I'm going to join the Army. Not only that, I'm going to sign up that I, I want to go be a paratrooper. And beyond that, whatever, you know, if I could, if I could do that, then I'll know that, okay, maybe, maybe I am a man. Maybe I can make it in this world. <clears throat> so off I went. I make it through basic training, through advanced training, and uh, they shipped me off to the 82nd Airborne Division. And it was there that I was to take the, um, the training, the jump training, go through jump school, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And uh, so I... I went through that, made my five jumps, I made it. I thought, okay, this is it, I've done, I've, I've done what I wanted, and so I just gotta finish my hitch in the service, and then off, off I go with the rest of my life. Well, before, it wasn't very long that they recruited me to be a parachute rigger. I'd finished jump school and said, okay, well that sounds like fun, learn how to pack parachutes and make airdrops, dropping supplies and stuff like that, like I talked about in Vietnam there and in Laos. And so I went off to jump to uh, rigor school in Fort Lee, Virginia, came back, <clears throat> and I wasn't back more than a month, and I was recruited and transferred into the 5th Special Forces, the Green Berets. It was uh, on Smoke Bomb Hill, which is in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, just, just down the road from the 82nd Airborne Division. Now I'm in Special Forces. I never requested this. I thought, oh wow, okay, what's going on? Why do they want me over there? And so they, we had some advanced training trying to get me caught up. You know, they tried to teach some language and, and some other things that I was going to need when I got in country. And soon I was on a plane headed for, for Vietnam. Um, when I got to Vietnam, what, was, what I was doing is I was doing a lot of parachute drops of supplies into Special Forces A teams. And also, th those were routine supplies, routine airdrops, but there was also a team that might have, that was being hit, you know, during some night that came at night always and attacked these various teams. And, and so we'd come in with whatever supplies they needed in an emergency situation. I'd do the airdrops, that kind of stuff. And I'd also, uh, when it come time for a team to do a parachute jump, I would go in with the parachutes and get them all rigged up, and I ended up making several parachute jumps in Vietnam. Here you can see the guys are all suited up, well, most of them anyway, getting ready to get on the airplane. I'm the guy that has to check them, make sure that they get their chutes on correctly. And uh, so we're just waiting for everybody to get lined up here. There's a shot of me coming. Yes, that's me. And that black case is where I keep the camera when I make a parachute jump. So when I get out and the parachute's open, I can uh, pull the camera out and shoot pictures. There I am shooting pictures of the other guys around me. It's really quiet when you make a parachute jump. There's no wind because you're floating with the wind. It's really neat, really cool. That was a lot of fun. Anyway, that's me with my mustache. I'm looking up at my parachute there. And I just flip the camera around, and that's South Vietnam. And we're floating down, and it's a lot of fun. And uh, anyway, so, and I would go out with the guys to make a jump and uh, pick up the parachutes when we're done, bring them back to the base, repack them, and, and uh, get ready for the next mission, whatever that happens to be. And we're floating down. The slots are in the parachutes are for steering.
So that's basically what, what I was doing in Vietnam. But the very first unexplainable thing that to this day nobody can, can figure out what happened, how it happened, was I was at an airfield <clears throat> out, on the, out on the ground. It was just a, a grass field. And, um, and it was during the monsoon season. And during monsoon season, you could just about set your watch every day at 4 o'clock. A, a, a storm front would come in, a wall of clouds, sometimes just as flat as you would think a piece of paper, and extending up 20, 30,000 feet. And it would come in, marching across and coming right over you. And of course, when it hit, it started raining cats and dogs. And it would rain for 20, 30 minutes, and then it would be over. And, and uh, anyway, so on this one particular day, uh, we had covered everything up. It was like five minutes to four, and so we'd all headed for cover. And there was two of us, uh, myself and another guy. I remember his name, Albert P. Griffith. He was a big guy, and I was a little guy. Uh, I probably weighed 125 at that time, and he was probably close to 180 pounds maybe closer to 200, I don't know. But the two of us were standing just inside the opening of a, a CP tent, a command post tent, <clears throat> a canvas tent you'd, you'd see in military movies, um, probably with a 10-foot wide opening and um, maybe 20 feet, maybe 25 feet deep. Well, inside, this was an office, the command post for for you know, loading, you know, if, a, if we had to make an airdrop, emergency airdrop that would come through this, this tent out in the field, had telephones and radios and all kinds of gear. There was a, a desk, uh, chairs, filing cabinet, and a bunk. I was scheduled to spend the night there in case an emergency call came in. I would be the first one. I'd jump out of the bunk and, and go find the right uh, packages that need to be dropped, ordinance, whatever. Uh, needed to go out, and I would start that process. So when the when the pilot got there, uh, you know, we'd be half ready to go. Well, <clears throat> as I was standing there inside the opening of the tent, and Griffith was right next to me on my right side, just inside the opening of the tent, we were watching the storm front come in, and uh, there was always a little uh, wind gust ahead of it. The wind gust would blow the leaves around and maybe flap the tent flaps a little bit, but but uh, never amounted to much, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, on this particular day, as I was watching the storm front, which is always a spectacular sight, this, these clouds, as they were coming in across the field, all of a sudden out of the corner of my eye, I saw Griffith's feet come up in the air about the height of my shoulder, both of his feet up in the air, and I turned to look to see what is going on. And as I turned to look, he was flying backwards into where the tent was because the tent exploded like a bomb went off, just blew the tent and it just went flying up into the air. Along with all of the furniture, the, the desk and the chairs and the filing cabinet, which had all kinds of, of secret documents in it about where we're sending supplies, that filing cabinet was tumbling across the grass and all these papers were just flying through the air, just a huge cloud of stuff. Griffith landed probably 30 feet off into the grass over there, and everything was skinned off, including the, the, the metal bunk that I was supposed to spend the night on, except that there was a, um, a mattress on it, was just laying over beside where the bunk was on the outside where the tent used to be. As I turned and looked at all of this, everything was gone. It didn't even blow my hat off. I was standing there like, like I was watching a movie or something. But it actually happened. Everything was blown away, but I wasn't touched, not, not a scratch. And not only that, I had brought a, a small um, shortwave radio I was going to listen to that night. And I brought it and I set it on that bunk. The mattress like somebody had come in and folded the mattress over that radio and set it down on the ground and took the bunk, which was made of steel, and blew it away. And the mattress was still sitting there. Me and my stuff were not touched. 
Before I left Vietnam, I had been doing a lot of this work, uh, a lot of airdrops and stuff. I had also worked with a company called Air America. I'd flown on a few of their planes. And while I was still in country, they recruited me to join Air America as soon as I got out of the service. And I thought, oh, this, that's interesting. And, and, and soon I rotated back to the States, and within a couple of months I was out. And then I called up this, the headquarters, which was in Washington, D.C., and um, um, Air America at the time was a CIA uh, operation. It was quite secret. Um, they said, okay, uh, they knew all about me. I gave them my service number, and they checked everything out. And they had me on an airplane within three days. <laughs> they told me how to get my passport in one day and, and um, get on a plane. And I was headed overseas, and I ended up in Laos. Well, now I'm with Air America. I'm in the country of Laos, which uh, is primarily working along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, um, watching you know, what supplies are going down into South Vietnam. Essentially, I'm doing the exact same thing I did in in Vietnam, but now working for uh, Air America and uh, getting paid a lot better than I was in the service. And I ended up do, uh, with Air America for uh, five years total, doing this, uh, flying as much as, oh, up to 180 hours a month in, in some cases, but typically less than that. So then the very first thing that happened to me in um, the country of Laos, is I was on a cargo plane, a C-123 provider airplane, and we were carrying uh, aviation gasoline. Uh, this gasoline was in 55-gallon uh, steel drums, and the cargo plane was, had a wide body, so we could load, we could roll these steel drums in and stand them up on end and fit them as tight together as possible. We could get about 30 drums 30, 32 drums on the airplane. And we were headed up country to a place where we could land, offload, and the, this aviation gas would be used by helicopters that were working from a uh, main base out to the different teams that were out in the field. And so they needed this um, aviation gas. And it was 115, 145 octane, high octane. The higher the octane is to, so that when you have re really high compression engines, it doesn't pre-detonate, which would destroy the engine. So you could go under military power. And anyway, so this is very volatile fuel. <clears throat> well, we were headed into this, this uh, site. It was uh, Lima Site 32. Uh, I remember the, the designation. Uh, I can't remember the name of the site. It's been quite a few years. But anyway, we were headed in there, and we were going to land. Well. We, had, we were flying about an hour and a half, and we got up to this spot and overhead, and it was all socked in. There was clouds below us. But the captain remembered that, well, we passed a hole in the, in the clouds back uh, a ways, about five minutes back. Let's circle back. We'll go down through, through the hole and come up underneath the clouds, and we can land. And when we take off, we'll just punch up through the clouds. No big deal. This was pretty much standard routine. It wasn't a big deal. And so uh, I was sitting in the back waiting for the gear to go down. It's usually the first sign, okay, we're, we're close and we're getting ready to land. And um, when we go into these really short airfields, we have locking pins that we put in the main gear we, through little excess panels. And we do that to make sure the gear doesn't collapse on us because we hit pretty hard trying to, trying to get the plane stopped. And so waiting for the gear to go down, and we had dropped down through the hole, and now we were coming up underneath. We were just punching over, or just clipping over the top of these ridges. And um, I was kind of kicked back, and I was looking up at the ceiling, and suddenly I started seeing, I started seeing holes appear in the ceiling, little spots of light. And all this happened really fast, and um, immediately I recognized these are bullet holes. And with all the noise of the airplane and the headset and everything, I couldn't hear the gunfire going off, but I can hear the sound, the punching of, of a bullet punching through the, the metal of, the, of the, um, the ceiling in the airplane. 
And I got on the horn right away, we're taking ground fire. And then they were hearing it up there too. So everybody was on the, was uh, uh, recognizing what was going on. Immediately they applied power and we started climbing back up through, through the, the clouds. And well, we got it punched out on top and well, we didn't dare attempt to land. We had all these bullet holes in the airplane and we didn't know. I was busy checking, okay, as, is, is there an oil leak? Do you see any fires back there? You know, what's going on? And checking everything, even checking the tires, we're going to head back to the base and land and try to figure out what kind of damage was done to the airplane. And as I was sitting there looking up at the bullet holes in the ceiling, I realized how did those bullets come up through the floor get in between those cans of gas. There's very tight space. If you can imagine lining up a bunch of cans as tight as you can get them together, it had to come up through the spaces between the cans. None of them hit the cans of gas. And my knees started getting a little wobbly and I thought, boy, this is really a close one. And so we called ahead and boy, they had the fire trucks lining up the runway and, and, and as we as we touched down, we didn't know if we were going to have brakes or if we were going to blow a tire or whatever. It would have been very serious with all that gas on board. You know, we could have had a big explosion. As we pulled up on the ramp, everybody at the airport was there, standing there waiting for us to taxi in. And, oh, wow. And, they, and as we pulled up and parked, everybody was underneath the wings pointing up at holes in the airplane. And I thought, oh, my. <coughs> but nothing happened. Unexplainable, unbelievable, but there's more. Next, I want to tell a story of when um, this was during the time we called, we, there was, it was called the Battle for Skyline Ridge. Skyline Ridge in central Laos was a ridge right above um, the, the secret base that uh, Long Chen, which uh, if any of you watch the movie Air America, uh, they were always trying to get, the senator was trying to get them to go to this secret air base. Well, anyway, it, it was at this secret air base. We were in there almost every day, or I was. I mean, hundreds of planes landed there every day, bringing in supplies. Um, they had uh, uh, Lao fighter planes, which were T-28s, would take off from there. And anyway, it was a pretty busy spot. So anyway, the, the bad guys, the North Vietnamese and the Path at Lao, were pushing in to take over this field because it was causing them a lot of problems. And so <clears throat> we landed there, we were in a caribou, and we would be loaded up with uh, uh, parachute airdrops of ordnance because we had, we had teams up on the ridge line which were uh, looking down at, at this airfield. And um, so they were trying to defend to keep the bad guys from getting, from taking over the ridge and they would come down in and then hit the airfield. And so we were trying to keep them resupplied. Well, we would, we would load up, climb up within five minutes. We'd be making an airdrop. We'd be landing, loading up again and going again. And we were doing this all day. And every time we flew over this one team, there was a guy with a, with a big gun down there shooting at us, poking holes in our airplane. And so we, we, called, we, we called in and says, do we have any uh, magic dragons in the area that could come in? You know, magic dragon, the airplane that has the Gatling guns that shoot out the side window. And they circle around and can hit a target on the ground. And, and they did have one that would come in and, and help us. And so we had to stay there to spot for this airplane, for the the magic dragon to come in to show him where the this problem was. And it was late in the day and um, we were getting low on fuel and we were going to finish this drop and then head back uh, to the main base back in Vinchin. Well anyway, um, as we were circling, uh, we we called and, and um, you know, where is this magic dragon? It says, well, we're, we're here. And we were looking around, you know, and trying to figure out, we don't see any, you know, Magic Dragon airplane. And we were down probably 1,500 feet above the ridge and says, okay, what altitude are you at? And they were at 10,000 feet. 
the guys with the big guns weren't going to come down where we were. And just as we were looking at each other, you know, like, what are we doing here? You know, <laughs> Just then, we hit, we went through the wake turbulence. We had heard it on the radio that an artillery uh, uh, group had started an open fire on these guys. And we had flown right through, right behind the shells that almost, you know, we almost got it right there. And we looked at each other and said, let's go home. <laughs> How did we make it through that? Oh, wow. Another story. Um, this one, it's sort of believable, but it's unbelievable. We were in, it was late in the day, and we'd picked up, we were to make uh, an airdrop of food supplies into a, uh, a little valley. And it was, it was very late in the day, and, and as you get closer to... Um, the equator, um, when the sun goes down, it goes down fairly quickly. And, you know, and it was about that time of day that the sun, we were just getting over the drop zone just as the, the sun was setting. And, and we, were, we were running pretty late and we thought, oh boy, this is going to be a tough one. And we had to drop down in this valley. And the, the mountain ridges, we were probably 1,800 feet in the tops of the mountains, were probably 6,000, 7,000 feet. And so we were down in a hole, a long valley, and we were circling and we'd drop a bundle, it's in a C-47, a Goonie Bird, like a DC-3, you remember what those are, C-47 is the military designation. And uh, uh, as we made the first pass, we said, hey, you guys light a bonfire down there, we, we can't even see anymore. It was that getting so dark that, you know, we don't even know where to drop, we're, we're going to keep circling. We have a bonfire, so they got something lit down there, and, and we were dropping, you know, our cargo goes down by parachute, and it doesn't actually land on the bonfire. It, you know, it, it scatters around maybe three or 400 feet. But anyway, we were dropping on this and dropping probably two bundles at a time. We had to make about four passes. And as we finished the last pass, the captain applied power, and the right engine died. Now... A C-47 can maintain altitude at just under 5,000 feet on one engine. But climbing to 5,000 feet on one engine, well, that's, that would be a big job. And it would take a long time. You might climb it 50 to 100 feet per minute, maybe. And here we were down in this small little valley. And this was back in the days when there was no navigational aids of no GPS, none of that stuff. It was all visual flight rules. And pretty much you had to be able to see the mountains and to recognize, okay, this, we're at so-and-so place. And, and so there was all of this issue. So here we were at well below a safe altitude with one engine, totally dark. And I mean pitch dark. This little, the camp that we had uh, dropped at there was only that bonfire. There weren't any other lights. There was nobody else in this valley. Uh, the bad guys were clear down at the other end, and uh, there was nothing. We couldn't see anything. We couldn't see the mountains, the ridges. We could see a few stars overhead, but not, not enough to be able to navigate by. And we had a problem. The captain kept the airplane lined up on the long axis of the valley as we tried to figure out what to do. And things happened really fast. I ran up to the front. I knew we were in trouble when we lost that engine. And the captain told me and the other kicker that was with me, a local allow kicker that was on the airplane helping me, uh, you guys better jump. And says, we're going to stick with the plane because, as it turned out, we had picked up another American pilot uh, who, uh, his plane was broke down up at 20 alternate, the Long Chin. His plane had broke down, so he decided, well, I might as well go back to the, the back home and you fix the airplane, I'll come back and fly some more, you know. And so four of us had parachutes. The captain co-pilot had a parachute and myself and the other kicker. But here was this American on board. And so the captain said, to told, told us, we better jump. They're going to stay with the airplane and, and, and see what they can do. And... Uh, Wow, I thought, okay. I went back and I alerted the other 
kicker and we put on our survival vest, our survival kits, it snaps onto our parachute harness. We were standing in the door and we were both ready to jump. And um, I don't know, for some reason, I wasn't scared. I'd made many, many jumps and it was no big deal. But I got to thinking, you know, we're headed down to the wrong end of the valley. And in Laos, if any anybody was shot down in Laos and captured by the Path at Lao or the, or the North Vietnamese or whatever, they were never seen again and because uh, w we were not supposed to be there. And so it was an unofficial war. <clears throat> and I was thinking about this as I was standing in the door, ready to go out, and I thought, that's not a very good option either. And what the captain and the co-pilot and this other guy, he was a helicopter pilot, the helicopter pilot said at the other end of the valley, a right turn, there was a river that went out. And if you could get into that gorge, that canyon, it would lead you south out uh, to safety <clears throat> at this altitude that we were at. Well, the problem was, okay, you're totally blind. There's nothing going to tell you when you get to that valley to make the turn, that canyon that was uh, a, a, a dog leg 90 degrees off to the right. And so <clears throat> what they had to do was they had to guess. Now, normally, if you know you're at one position and you were going to fly, say, 10 miles, you would calculate by your airspeed how many minutes and seconds it would be for you to make that turn. Well, that would be all great and good. We knew the distance, but nobody was thinking to, to take a time hack of exactly when we left the drop zone. They were busy jockeying the throttles, trying to get feather the engine that died and, and to get going, so nobody looked at their watch at that time. So they had to guess. They had to guess when they were going to turn down this valley. And it was a narrow gorge. And so I was standing in the back of the airplane thinking about, okay, do I jump out and take my chances on the ground? Uh, or do I stay with them and maybe they're going to make it? <clears throat> and what was going through my head was, you know, just, just about that time they started to bank the airplane to make the turn into the valley. And I thought, okay, this is it. We were going to know in probably 30, 40 seconds if we made it into the canyon. And I was thinking, okay, I could jump now, but then I got to thinking, you know, maybe it's kind of foolish that I'm, I joined this outfit and playing this, this dangerous game. But I thought, okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick it out. And I was thinking, I'm, I'm not going to jump. And the plane made the turn and leveled off, and I says, okay, any second now. And I was thinking, you know, if we splat into the side of the canyon, it'll be over in a second. I won't even know that we hit the wall, and that'll be it. That'll be the end of my life, and, and anyway, it was fun while it lasted. And these kind of things were going through my mind. <clears throat> well, we got leveled. Again, can't see anything, totally black. I was standing in an open door looking out, pitch black, nothing. And, you know, and, 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 and 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, after about a minute, I thought, we must be in the canyon. I ran up into the cockpit and I asked the captain, you know, the captain and the co-pilot and this chopper pilot were all up there, um, you know, trying to guess what to do next. And I ran up and I said, we made it. He says, we don't know that we made it. I could be inches from this canyon wall on this side or the other side, I don't, I don't dare turn. I don't know what to do. We're flying straight ahead. Any moment we could, we could run into something. And uh, so now I was up in the cockpit up in the front and I thought, oh boy. And I decided I wasn't going to jump and so I was sitting there. So the four of us were up there and we were flying probably another two to three more minutes. We were flying along and then suddenly Suddenly, off to our left front, about uh, 30 degrees off of our course, there was a light up in the sky. And we all saw it at once. The only thing that we have seen the whole time this was going on, besides the bonfire that was back down the valley, here was this light. 
And we didn't have to tell the captain, why don't you turn towards the light? Because there's no mountains between us and that light. It, but the captain was already turning. It, I mean, everybody was on board. We knew, okay, that's safety if we can go towards that light. So we turned on that light and we started flying and we thought, oh, wow, you know. And we, we could tell we were used to seeing lights at night, whether another light is moving like another airplane. We could tell if the light was moving or if it was stationary. And it was a stationary light. So we knew that if we got our nose on it, uh, we're, we're okay. Now, as we started flying <coughs> um, towards that light, suddenly, after about two minutes, suddenly off to our left, we could see the valley floor. We had broken out on this side of, uh, but of, of the canyon. We could see that on the valley floor, but the left side was still blocked. We could see village, village lights down below us, probably, oh, by this time they were 2,000 feet down below us. And we could see them scattered out there. And then after about another 30 seconds, then suddenly this had cleared and then we could see the valley down there. What we realized was if we'd have kept going the way we were, we'd have run smack into this mountain that was blocking the, the straight direct course that we were headed on and this light that appeared <coughs> uh, guided us off. Now as we, as we turn and we were looking at this, what happened to the light? The direction that the light came from, there were no mountains out there for at least 150 miles, some distance. We were looking out over the, the basin of the Mekong River, and, which was in some distance off. And then way beyond that, there were mountains. But this light was very visible and it didn't seem to be that far away. It was stationary up in, the, up in the sky right there. What was that light that saved us? These stories that I've just shared with you, and there's a couple more, um, not quite as dramatic as those. These were unexplainable issues. I didn't know what was going on at the time. Some years later, some years later, I had um, been introduced, I'd found, um, I had gone to a Revelation seminar, and in this Revelation seminar, it talked about prophecy and different things, and I'd come to, come to a decision that, okay, I wanted to follow the Lord. And I'm back in the United States, and married, <coughs> and um, both my wife and I, um, um, had decided to be baptized. And we were getting ready, preparing to be baptized, and I was thinking about all of these issues, things that had happened in my life that were unexplainable. When I was a kid and, and, and getting in the service and, and you know making it through the 82nd Airborne Division through jump school and ending up in Special Forces and, and then being recruited by Air America and all of these things, and then these unexplainable events the wind event and, and the different situations that I got into that just, you know, just seemed impossible. How could that ever happen? Well, <clears throat> but I was remembering these things and I was thinking, oh, wow, you know, you know, maybe the Lord was guarding me. But that doesn't make any sense because I didn't know the Lord then. I was a heathen like everybody else, you know, drinking and partying and, and, uh, not thinking about God or anything like that. And, but you know, still th this question was in my mind, what's going on? And then after we were, Margie, my first wife, after we were, uh, were baptized, my parents came to visit me. Now, my mom was a spiritualist. Uh, she, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't go to church or anything when I was a kid. Did we pray? Did we do anything? There was none of that. But as I was sharing this story with my mom, telling her about these events, she said, Richard, don't you remember? Because, uh, let me back up here. Uh, I was joining the Seventh-day Adventist church. <coughs> and 
and I'd mentioned that we, we were baptized in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And so my mom said, Richard, don't you remember me telling you that when you were born, right in the delivery room, right there, the doctor picked you up, held you in his hands, and he said a special prayer over you. He said that doctor was a Seventh-day Adventist. After I picked myself up off the ground, <laughs> I realized the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Could it be the day I was born, the prayer was said to protect me, and God sent his guardian angels, watch over this kid. As I think about it, it chokes me up. I hope to meet that doctor in heaven. God bless.